your camera lens may be defective without you even knowing about it. Today, I'm talking about decentered lenses, what it means, how to test for it, and what you should do if you have one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Timix Stolars, and on this channel, I talk about camera related gear and tech, as well as do tutorials for photo and video related topics. If that's something you're interested in, click that subscribe button because you never know what you might learn in my next video. Okay, decentered lenses. What is it and why should everyone be aware of it? In the simplest terms, it means that the many glass elements that make up your lens have shifted or tilted from their intended axis, and the light entering your lens is diverged in an unintended way before it hits your camera sensor. The result of this presents itself by making areas of your image appear soft and out of focus even in the areas that are in the same plane of focus. This is most apparent in the edges of your image, but it can also affect an entire side depending on how decentered your lens is. The kicker is all lenses are unfortunately decentered to some extent, and there's no perfect lens, but a bad copy will completely ruin your images. From what I gather, servicing this problem is very expensive, the repair quality of the recentering isn't always consistent, and I've read that this isn't always covered under warranty. Because of this, it's a good idea to complete some easy tests on a new lens as soon as you get it. And if you suspect a decentered lens, return it for a new copy. Have you ever thought there was something funky going on with your lens? Do you think now that it was decentered? Let me know in the comments below if you knew how to check for it. So how does a lens become decentered in the first place? This can occur in the manufacturing process, during shipping, and if the lens is dropped. Most lens manufacturers have strict quality control protocols that will catch most bad copies, but not every lens manufacturer has the same standards either. Unfortunately, even if it makes it out of the factory in good shape, a lens will be handled several times before it makes it into your hands. In addition, it's worth noting that this occurs on zoom lenses more than primes, as well as faster lenses with wider apertures over smaller ones. This is in part because the wider you open the aperture, the shallower your depth of field becomes. This will make problematic areas more obvious and pronounced. An f4 lens is already quite a bit more closed than an f1.4 lens, and smaller apertures already naturally hide the negative impacts of a decenter lens by increasing the area that are in focus. Finally, plastic lenses are more prone to decentering because they allow more give and movement of the glass inside. Moving on to the testing methods. I found two ways to complete a decentered lens analysis, and I personally like to do both so I can get confirmation of results. Test number one is using a star chart, and I've attached one to a link on BH's website. One thing to note is if you're printing at home on a regular sized piece of paper, it will not be large enough to fill the whole frame for lenses with focal lengths wider than about 45 millimeters. This is for a full frame camera, so approximately 70 millimeters on a crop sensor. This is definitely quite a bit limiting, so I decided to print the chart over four pieces of paper. Setting this up correctly is a little bit of a challenge, and you need to cut off the edges of the paper even when you set zero margins on the printer. Then you need to line them up perfectly and glue them onto a poster. I was not able to line it up perfectly, but I think I got close enough for this to work. This method allowed me to just barely check my widest lens of 24 millimeters, and I doubt much wider would work with this chart size. With this chart, you want to tape it to your wall and use a light source so you can keep your ISO down. And try to line up your camera as close to a right angle from the chart as possible. The more you are off a perfect perpendicular from the wall, the larger the difference in distances between the left and right sides of the chart. Being even slightly off will affect your results at wider apertures with razor thin planes of focus. It sounds simple enough, but in practice, I found it very difficult to actually make sure I was exactly 90 degrees away from the chart. The chart has these guide marks with different aspect ratios. A normal photo aspect ratio is three to two and video is 16 to nine. I recommend checking these lenses with photos for higher resolution so these triangles are the ones you want to put in the corners. Once you think you have the right positioning, set your aperture to the widest your lens will go and experiment with the shutter speed and ISO to properly meter the frame. Make sure you have enough light to use a higher shutter speed and a lower ISO for the cleanest possible photo. It would also be a really good idea to use a shutter release or a timer to make sure you don't introduce any camera shake that could occur when you press the button manually. I personally use the companion app to control the shutter release that most cameras should offer. I also like to shoot these photos in RAW so I can bring up the exposure and shadows in post if I want to see more detail. Once I have my exposure set and my focus on manual, I zoom in digitally to make sure focus is perfect. 
which is incredibly easy with these star charts. I start with the widest aperture and stop down once or twice. You can step down as many times as you'd like, but it will create more work for you when you're analyzing these images. And the biggest problems will show themselves when the aperture is widest. Realistically, I would probably return the lens if there was any signs of being decentered at its widest, so stepping down once was enough for me. If you are using a zoom lens, repeat this process for the shortest, longest, and middle focal lengths. Once you've uploaded your photos onto your computer, it's time to do some post-processing. I use Lightroom and Photoshop, and if you don't have them, Adobe offers a seven day free trial if you'd like to follow along. You can either open them up on Lightroom first or directly in Photoshop. As I mentioned earlier, it's beneficial to shoot the photos in RAW so you can increase the exposure and shadows if needed. You can't actually open up RAW images in Photoshop directly. It creates a different file that Photoshop works off of. I like to keep these separate personally and I open up my images in Lightroom first and export the touch-ups as PNGs that I later open up in Photoshop. Due to the orientation of my light source, the left side of my image is darker. I added a gradient to lighten that side up as well as I bumped up the shadows. That's it, it's ready to export. Then I open up the images in Photoshop, copy it four times and shift them around so that the corners line up in the middle. Based on the orientation of the image, it should be easy to tell which corner you're looking at, but things will be mirrored. Highlight all the layers and press Command T to transform each layer and pick a magnification to your liking. Now you can clearly compare each corner against the others. Save as a JPEG at the highest quality. It seems that my lens copy passed the test for this method and I do not see any significant variation between the corners. They all appear to have an acceptable level of sharpness. If the lens was decentered, you would likely see some level of softness in one of the corners like this or along an entire side. Test number two is my preferred method because it's easier to complete and I'm a little bit more confident with the results. All you need to do is go outside and find a distant object like a light post to focus on. Put the object in the center of the frame, set focus to manual and punch in to double check. Once your focus is set, make sure you do not touch the focus ring at all or else your results will not be accurate. Take a photo with the object in the center of the frame and one in each corner. Similar to before, do this at the lens's widest aperture and stop down as many times as you'd like. There is a little bit more post-processing in this method, so keep that in mind. Back on the computer, I opened the five images up in Lightroom. I clearly had the wrong white balance while I took these photos, so the only edits I'm going to do is changing that, bumping up the exposure and the shadows. Copy and paste the settings to all the other photos, and export as a PNG. Open the images up in Photoshop and drag all the photos into one project so all five are in separate layers. Pick one of the images and use the rectangle tool to create a reference box around the light post. Turn down the opacity so you can still see the light post behind them and then shift around each layer until they are all aligned in the rectangle. Now delete everything outside the box in each layer. And move the layers around to match them to the correct position. Move the bottom right corner image to the bottom right and the top right corner image to the top right and so on. Once all of them are aligned, you can double check to make sure they are all in the correct space, which will be obvious from the remainders of the photos that weren't cut in each layer. Same as before, highlight all the layers and transform them to a scale that fills the frame the best. Save as a JPEG at the highest quality. As with the first test, we can once again see that each corner sharpness is very similar to one another. And I'm confident in saying that any imperfections of alignment are not significant enough to negatively impact image quality. Keep in mind for this method, each corner image should be compared to the sharpness of other corners, not the center frame, which is just for reference. We can then open up both images and compare the two to see if the results confirm each other or not. 
Remember for the chart comparison, the orientation of the corners will be different from the orientation of the light posts if you complete the alignment the same way as me. So that is what a decentered lens is and how to check for it. I hope I was able to provide you with some useful information that may save you some time, money, or energy in the future. If you think I did, hit that like button and let me know in the comments below if you hadn't heard about a decentered lens before this video or if checking for a decentered lens is the first thing you do with new glass. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.